Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of Innova, alive and composing, with today's guest, Jeremy Beck. Would you please state your name for the record, Jeremy? Jeremy Beck. Happy to be here. Speaking of records, um, you've got three of them. We can see them over your shoulder and they're all on Innova. We're very proud of this fact, but does it betray a certain dogged personality? Are, 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 you, are you prone to never giving up? Um, I think that's right. I been composing for uh, ever since I was a teenager and I'm now 53 years old and um, the career has had its uh, ups and downs but uh, mostly uh, ups these days so I feel good about that but I think it is about um, perseverance and um, staying through the dry spells and just moving forward with one with one's art and uh, and not giving up hope and over time, how has you, your work evolved? Uh, you've been through, I, I remember you've been to Africa, right? Back in the distant past? Boy, yeah, in, uh, in the mid-90s, uh, through a friend, I, I had gone to Ghana and I had done some teaching and uh, studying some West African drumming while, I'm there, while I was there. And um, I do have one piece that's, that's probably the most directly influenced, uh, obviously, percussion ensemble piece. But um, some of the rhythms and ideas uh, derived from those rhythmic patterns are things that um, I think have stayed in, in at least certain of my pieces and have also combined with uh, my general background in um, not just sort of standard classical repertoire, but jazz and pop music. Uh, and so that's always infused my writing, I think, consistently with uh, certain rhythmic interplay and um, syncopations that, that help make uh, at least some of the pieces uh, lively in a kind of fun way. Whenever I listen to your music, I am impressed not only with the craft, but how lively and personality rich that craft is. Mm. Um, is that a special quality you think you have or do you think everyone has it and it's just uh, you've got to dig in further? Well I, I hope that everyone has it or potentially has it. I mean as for me I think part of it actually circles back to, to where this all started which is uh, the notion of perseverance and um, I guess I've always had a good sense of the kind of music that I wanted to hear that that I would create and so um, it's not that I follow trends it's not that I'm uh, trying to be like someone else or trying to please someone else uh, for me it's about working with the musicians and uh, communicating to an audience and um, in what I do there's a range of, of what that is whether something is more tonal less tonal I, it really doesn't matter after a certain point because it's really about what an individual piece needs uh, to be true to itself in terms of what it needs to to communicate to to a particular audience or um, for a particular situation and whatever consistency that I have in what I do I think is uh, partly related to to my being at least at some level confident that what I do is is correct even if someone at some point has told me that uh, that it's not what I should be doing um, and, and I think ultimately composers need to have that they need to uh, perhaps not be stubborn about it be open to new ideas and try new things which I've certainly done uh, especially when I was in school but at a certain point I think one just decides that this is who I am, this is what I do, and I'm going to do it. And it communicates to some people, it doesn't communicate to others, and that's perfectly fine. Are there musical things you can imagine right now never doing in your, in your life? Um, you know, there was a, a brief, there was a window where... Um, where I was interested in not just acoustic, writing for acoustic instruments, but also exploring electronics. And I quickly found that um, there were other composers who were far more interested in, in that kind of exploration and those uh, types of resources. And so would spend the kind of time needed to really understand those resources. And so at a certain point I just stopped. It's, it's, um, it's not that it disinterests me, it's just I realize it's not where certain of my strengths lie and 
you know, ultimately time is short and, and I'd rather spend the time on, on what it is that I do and what I feel most comfortable doing. So probably I won't be writing electronic scores um, anytime soon. Do you feel you're part of a particular lineage or tradition? Uh, who are your heroes that uh, you wouldn't mm -hmm. mind being buried next to? Sure. Um, I'm uh, certainly I love uh, tonal music of the 20th century and really the broad range of that, which um, I mean, even when I was a kid, I loved uh, Shostakovich and Prokofiev, the, um, Stravinsky. Bartok and Ravel, Debussy and the American Copeland, I mean Barber. And it's not that my music sounds like any of those composers really, but um, but there's a lot that I learned from those composers and, and certainly from uh, more, I don't know, more avant-garde uh, composers like uh, more the Eastern European composers, um, Ligeti and Ludoslavsky. I mean, one listening to my music wouldn't necessarily associate what I do with those composers, but aspects of their organizational practice, aspects of how they approach certain materials, um, then goes through my own filter in combination with my other interests and influences, which, I mean, also go back to, as I mentioned before, to, to jazz and, and popular music. And again, it's not that you know, you'll, that one would hear Stephen Sondheim or the Beatles or or Keith Jarrett in what I do, but it's all ultimately it's part of um, part of my history, and and I feel that I'm part of that that spectrum that that is uh, ongoing. You also have a secret life, right? I do. And if this weren't your musical interview, you might have legal textbooks behind you. Is that true? And uh, w t tell us about. Uh, what you do during the day and how it might relate to uh, understanding the real Jeremy Beck. Sure. Um, well, I'm a practicing attorney. I practice uh, with a, a firm in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, my particular practice is um, really divided in a, a few areas. It's uh, entertainment law, it's general business, and trademark and copyright, intellectual property. And at first glance, sometimes those um, these two aspects of, of my life may seem um, rather unrelated, but, but but actually they're they're quite related. I even before I went to law school, uh, I was writing contracts for my music uh, licenses, uh, having to review those types of uh, things, hiring musicians. I mean, all of these are uh, the general business practices of a composer. And now I not only do those things for myself, but I do them for other composers um, and other musicians and visual artists and other people associated with the arts. And really it's a, as, as my father would put it, it's kind of a left brain, right brain balance of things. And um, I've found that uh, it's, it's a balance that, that has worked for me um, and may not work for everyone, but, but I enjoy both aspects of, of my life. And uh, um, what can I say? It works. Is there some aspects of that same rigor, persistence, and attention to detail, and satisfaction in getting the right uh, mot juste? I, I would say that's right. I would say that's right. That um, particularly, I mean, I guess when I went to law school, which I, I did later in life, um, following studies in music and teaching for a time um, in academia. Uh, some of my fellow law students uh, wondered about uh, coming from a music background and going into law and I think that eventually they came to understand that uh, really musicians in general, uh, what makes a successful musician, what makes a su successful composer is the ability to focus on details and to understand both the big picture and all the uh, moving parts that can that make up a p particular large picture. And certainly that's true in the law, having to understand details and interrelationships and um, an understanding of the present from the past. And um, all of that requires um, really similar thought processes and similar approaches to uh, how one organizes and understands uh, 
if you will, the raw material of either profession. I wonder if anyone's done uh, statistical research or any kind of investigation into composers who are also attorneys throughout history. And I'm showing my ignorance here by not being able to name a single one. Um, well, it's it, it's interesting. I, I mean, Stravinsky, I don't believe ever practiced, but but I know that um, he had studied law, and um, actually uh, Heinrich Schenker was an attorney. He had a law degree, um, and then of course there are other related examples. Uh, Ives working in the insurance business and being very successful and uh, writing pamphlets that I mean, I've never read but I understand may still be in use today. So it's, uh, it's not a completely foreign concept and um, in fact I know a couple of colleagues out there who, who are both composers and attorneys whether practicing now or not. Um, so it's, there's, there is a relationship. So string quartet. What, what, what is it about string quartets? So what, what place in history and in your mind do they occupy that no other art form does? Well, uh, the string quartet, uh, f even outside of history, um, for me is, is a very personal um, medium. I'm originally a cellist. I started playing the cello when I was in uh, fourth grade and played all the way through high school and really only started shifting more to composition when I when I went to Manus after I'd moved to New York and but during all the time that I played the cello uh, I was playing not only in the community orchestra and the high school orchestra but in a little uh, string quartet that we had and I remember very well that we played um, probably pretty roughly but we played the Ravel and that piece and and my understanding of it through playing the within the quartet, um, it, it, just the intimacy of it and again the, the, the detail of it and the interrelationship of the parts just um, made such an impression on me that has stayed with me and of course through history uh, the string quartet as a medium has been the place where many composers have um, focused some of their most important work um, and there is something about the four instruments where uh, there is no there's no place to hide. Everything is exposed, and so it requires a certain attention um, to to how those relationships work, and and how one creates a story or a drama um, through the the working of those of those parts. And certainly there are innumerable variations on, on how those problems can be um, solved or uh, can be worked with. And uh, for me, I have now have um, five string quartets uh, that's, that run from, I mean, the earliest is from the 1980s, which I wrote while I was still an undergraduate student and then just after when I did some revisions. And then the most recent, number five, which is from 2006, which I wrote in Louisville. Um, and so they really, uh, the ones in between are basically sort of spread out over the course of that period and in some ways uh, reflect uh, different ways of my thinking at those different times and provide snapshots into what I was um, doing at those different periods and by the same token show uh, a continuity I believe once one steps back and and sees n not only my development but um, but the, the what is what is a constant between um, those parts and I think one of the constants goes back to rhythm and um, being interested in, in syncopated ideas but where there's a sense of pulse and so there's a sense of forward motion even in slower music and then also a sense of lyricism and uh, melodic line um, because I think that uh, melody and lyricism and tonality uh, there's still plenty of room for them to grow and plenty of room for exploration and um, and I don't say that being defensive, I say it just um, as a truth. 
Is there a particular moment that you're especially proud of that we can listen to right now? Um, the last movement of the most recent quartet, string quartet number five, uh, was premiered in Louisville in, in 2010. Uh, it was premiered by uh, a quartet called the Da Capo Quartet, who were members of the Louisville Orchestra at the time. And um, we were able to record that shortly after the premiere. It's a beautiful performance, beautiful recording. And they capture the energy of this third movement um, beautifully. It's, uh, it begins with a rather um, spare kind of, there's a very uh, aggressive brief opening and then it unfolds in, in this kind of spare counterpoint that gradually um, starts to become layered as the parts become more involved. And um, I just, I, I like the way the clarity of the parts actually work themselves out. And um, I, I feel it's a very successful piece. Is there any kind of narrative or program in your mind, or do you just prefer it to be listened to in an abstract way for a for me, it's abstract. There's, there's not a program. It's about um, the, the musical and uh, dynamic and emotional relationships that are generated through the interaction of the, the four players. And that's what it's about. Well, Jeremy Beck, it's wonderful to hear your music, to hear you talk about your music, and to hear the correct pronunciation of Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Philip. It's good to be here. <laughs>